The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and get started. Let me introduce myself real quick. Um, so my name is Joe Brockmeyer. Some people know me as Zonker. Uh, for, I've been involved with Linux and open source now for, I uh, started using Linux in 1996. I've been doing um, writing and been professionally involved in Linux and open source one way or another since 1999. Um, so various times I worked for Linux Mall when I got started. I've been a freelance writer. I've been uh, editorial director of Linux.com, managing editor of Linux.com, editor-in-chief of Linux Magazine. Most recently I was writing for Read, Write Web and uh, Linux.com. Uh, but I wrapped that up on March 31st, starting on Monday. Um, I will actually be a open source evangelist for CloudStack, working with Citrix. Um, so this is the first group that I've actually announced that to, so, you know, it's a big scoop, right? So, yeah, um, really looking forward to that. Um, so I'm filling in on this talk for my boss, Mark Hinkle. He couldn't be here this weekend due to a uh, little bit of uh, bad uh, luck with his knees. Um, so this is his presentation. I probably will not do it as much justice as Mark did, uh, would, but I will give it a shot. Um, so this is a high-level overview of cloud computing. So um, we'll go through this. And uh, if you have any questions, I hope I can answer them. If you have anything specific about CloudStack, David Nally's over there in the corner. He's probably the best guy to answer that right now. Um, and also, you know, we'll, would love to hear from you all what you want to know about cloud for the next time I do this presentation. Um, so let's get through the obligatory what is the cloud stuff. Um, Five characteristics of clouds. Number one, it's on-demand self-service. This should be pretty uh, explanatory. You know, most people got their first introduction to cloud computing when you're talking about uh, infrastructure as a service, especially with Amazon. And uh, you know, the whole idea is basically you no longer have to worry about provisioning a server, buying a server, having a network, or anything else. You just go to Amazon and you plunk down your credit card, you set up an account, and boom, you have a cloud, uh, or you're on the cloud. Broad network access, pretty simple. You need to have network access for the cloud. Doesn't work real well without it. Uh, resource pooling, again, pretty self-explanatory. Rapid elasticity, one of the benefits of cloud is the idea that you can scale up and out very quickly. Uh, so you, again, don't have to worry about all the provisioning headaches that you have with physical servers when you're managing those servers. The cloud provider or your IT department handles all of the headaches there. And measured service, basically, they want to bill you. Or if you're doing an internal private cloud, uh, you want a way to, you know, associate costs with different groups in your business. You want to be able to say, you know, well, the marketing department is using this much because they're running the website, and the, you know, the sales department is using this much, or whatever. Uh, or if you are running a, if you are a hosting provider and you are running some sort of uh, cloud, you want to be able to bill your customers. So measured service is very important. Um, anybody not know the service models? You have basically software as a service. So if you're using something like Salesforce, uh, basically you just bring your data. You show up, you set up an account, you use the service, and you're inputting and using data stored there. They're providing all the software on that. The uh, next level is platform as a service. Basically they're providing the infrastructure and a platform to run your code on so you bring your code and your data. Um, and then finally, infrastructure as a service where basically you're responsible for architecting everything. You're responsible for figuring out how your applications are gonna scale and figuring out how many, uh, 
machines you need. Wow, we're just like growing like mad here. Um, could you shut that, please? Thank you. So, all right. Uh, any questions on any of that? That's all pretty self-explanatory, I think. Um, well, storage service is a functionality. I mean, uh, the something like that. Yeah. What What did you have in mind that you? you Well, and that's, that's one of the problems is that, you know, cloud is, is kind of one of those things. So, you know, like I said, before I, uh, before Monday when I start with Citrix, I've been writing a lot about cloud for like read, write web. And you, we get pitches, everything is cloud now. Any service is, you know, cloud. Um, and I try to restrict it to things that are specifically, you know, a new concept that weren't around, you know, what Amazon started, I think 2006. They got their EC2 2000, oh, was it 2005? Okay, all right. Um, so things that were around before that, you know, just because they're on the internet does not make them cloud, you know. Uh, one example, you could, you could make an argument for, uh, you know, Gmail as a cloud service, but it's webmail, you know. It's, it's not a cloud service the way that most people are thinking of it. Um, again, I mean, it's software as a service, I guess, but, you know, it's, Sure, yeah, but I think, I don't know, I, I think calling it cloud is a little overselling it, but anyway. Um, so then you have, if you're talking about infrastructure as a service or platform or, or software as a service, you have uh, deployment models. You have public, hybrid, and private. Um, pretty simple concept. The public cloud is something like Amazon or Salesforce where basically you're depending on a third party provider that they're, you know, kind of open the doors to anybody. Uh, private, you know, where a lot of companies and uh, government agencies are not terribly comfortable handing over their data or may be restricted from doing that. Um, so they want to run, they want the benefits of cloud services, but they want to run it behind their own firewall. They don't want the public to have any access. Hybrid is where it gets really interesting because you have the opportunity to control specific things and keep them behind your firewall, but maybe offload tasks to a public facility, um, you know, whenever your capacity is exceeded or where you have tasks that don't need to be kept behind your firewall. So you might run your website, your corporate website, uh, on something like Amazon EC2, but, you know, all your accounting functions are going to stay behind the firewall but your, you know, your IT department would have the ability to spin up something and move it over to EC2 so they can test all that deployment, not get charged for it by Amazon until they actually move it into production. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, you still have to think about your architecture when you're dealing with cloud. Um, you know, if, especially when you're doing your own applications, you don't just magically get scalability with cloud. It's not, it's kind of like open source. You know, when open source was really uh, beginning to, to become popular, companies just thought, wow, if we just slap an open source license on this, magically millions of developers will, you know, descend on our project and start contributing and everyone will be excited about it. Uh, it's not magical pixie dust. Um, you have to still think about how you're going to scale your apps where, wherever you're running them. Um, so you have to design with the end in mind and make it replicable. Uh, you want to make sure that you can easily basically cookie cutter your stuff out. Uh, let's talk about some of the open source software that is available uh, for building different kinds of clouds. Um, this is a di uh, diagram I won't go into too much, but basically, you know, what you need to do to design your own cloud, uh, depending on you know, whether you want to run software as a service for your internal customers, whether you want a platform or infrastructure, you need to have virtualized resources, so you need to have, you know, something capable of running virtual systems, you need to have the physical resources if you're not buying them from Amazon or somebody like that, you have to have software uh, to run your operating systems. Any questions on this? I don't know why, but SLA management is on that twice. I guess we considered it very important. Yeah.
I'm sorry, say again? If you, uh, the question is, if you have your own hardware, it's on a large scale. I'm not sure I understand what you're... Sorry. It doesn't have to be distributed. So no, the, uh, so the question is, does it have to be a distributed system to be a cloud? No, the, the concept of cloud really is the management aspect so that you can easily spin up managing virtual machines, for example. It doesn't necessarily have to be like, well, I have a zone here in uh, North Carolina and then I have another one in St. Louis. Uh, no, not necessarily. You can have a cloud in just a single data center. You can have a cloud in your living room if you have two computers, really. Well, one if you if you just want to run test stuff. Um, but you know, the the idea is to be able to scale things and easily provision and do things more than just managing virtualized servers. So it's another layer up on something like uh, KVM or Zen. Does that make any sense? Okay. It can be. It can be distributed. So I mean, you know, you can be using something where you have two or three data centers and you're managing systems across those, or if you're using Amazon, you can have you know, uh, you know, East and West Coast or Asia or something like that, where you have things in different thing in different zones where you can spin up, say you know, you can have something running on the East Coast, and if something like happened to Amazon last April where they have a, a catastrophic outage in one of their zones, you could spin up another one real quick. Um, so that is that is a possibility. So why open source? And this is what I'm, one of the reasons I'm really excited about CloudStack and all, in general, all of the open source cloud efforts that are going on. Uh, because I consider this sort of the next layer up from Linux. You know, this is kind of the next operating system for people, really. Um, User-driven solutions to real problems. You know, you have Amazon or you have VMware or somebody and they are saying, you know, this is our picture of cloud, this is what we think you should do. CloudStack and OpenStack and all those, um, you know, basically are saying these are what users demanded. These are the things that we're putting together and you have the opportunity to get in there and add features if we don't have what you need, you know. Uh, lower barrier to participation, again, you have the ability to get involved. You can just grab the code and start. Um, you can tinker with it. You don't have to worry about uh, you know, putting down a credit card for Amazon, or you don't have to worry about, um, you know, buying licenses from VMware. You can download the code and start working with it right away. All you need is the hardware. Um, you have a larger user base uh, for, you know, for these projects, larger, you know, number of contributors. Uh, aggressive release cycles, you basically, you know, open source, release early, release often. Uh, open data, open standards, and open APIs. Uh, one of the things that uh, you know, we have the opportunity to do, for example, is define our own APIs instead of taking whatever Amazon hands to you or whatever uh, VMware hands to you. The biggest thing for me is avoiding lock-in. You know, I think Amazon EC2 is a great service. You know, they're doing some really good stuff. But the downside is you kind of, if you create your architecture around Amazon EC2, you run the risk of being locked in there. Uh, if you create your infrastructure around Azure or uh, VMware, you run the risk of basically being locked into those services and those vendors. You know, with something like CloudStack, I live in St. Louis, and there's a vendor uh, in St. Louis called Contigix that is op offering what they're calling MiraCloud based on CloudStack. Um, if you get all, all of your stuff hosted in, at Contigix and you decide that for some reason you don't like Contigix, you can move to another hosting provider that offers CloudStack, or you can set it up yourself if you need to at some point. If your cost structure, if you scale out to a point where it no longer makes sense to pay them instead of having your own infrastructure. Any questions on the open source part? Being a Linux fest, I don't think I have to sell the concept of open source here. Good. Any skeptics on open source still? Jury still out? Okay. I guess Steve Ballmer is not in the audience. Um, anybody familiar with open virtualization format? Okay. Uh, I should ask anybody unfamiliar with open virtualization format? Okay. A couple folks. Um, so basically, this is a open standard as opposed to some of the closed standards for distributing, packaging, uh, you know, virtual machines. 
Uh, you know, with Amazon, you've got AMI, you've got uh, KBM has QCAL. Um, I love the names open source projects come up with, you know. Um, VMware has their proprietary VMDK format. Um, Hyper-V has VHD. Uh, basically, this tries to encompass several formats and, and make it possible to share between different things. You look like you have a question. Okay, I actually meant that guy. He all, okay. Um, yes, but it can, it can it can work with several services. Yeah. So, sorry. The question was, I'm going to do this Jeopardy style, I guess. You know, the question was, Alex. Um, you know, it works with each of those. So, um, some tools for creating VMs and appliances. You have Bitnami. Anybody use this? Um, Bitnami is really cool. Uh, nice little startup company. They've kind of been pivoting as technology changes. Uh, Bitnami, when they got their start, what they would do is create stacks of software you could install on your machines um, to make it easier. So, like, has anybody ever tried to install things like Bugzilla and gotten frustrated at all the dependencies? It's like, oh, I need MySQL and I need this and I need that. All I wanted to do was try, my, you know, Bugzilla and see if it was appropriate for my company. You download a stack and you start it up and they bundled all that software so it'll run. Uh, and they bundle it for Linux, Windows, and Mac in most cases. Um, so they started with executables that you would install on your own system. And then, you know, people started distributing more virtual uh, appliances and they started distributing virtual appliances. Well, now they've moved up the stack a little bit, and they're, uh, if you go to Amazon's marketplace, for example, you will find a bunch of uh, Bitnami stacks that are just ready to run on Amazon. So all you have to do is basically say, oh, I want to run WordPress. Fire up a Bitnami image, and you've got uh, that stack ready to go. Uh, and they also offer support contracts, so you can say, well, um, would you please make sure that we can you know, keep this up to date so I don't have to worry about updating this software myself. Uh, really great, I think, for small businesses uh, or, or small departments inside a business that want specific open source applications. Box Grinder, anybody familiar with this? This is uh, kind of in Fedora, okay, just a couple people. Box Grinder basically helps you grind out appliances. This is a, a good open source tool for creating uh, virtual appliances. Um, SUSE Studio, has anyone tried this? Anyone familiar with SUSE Studio? I'm sorry? Yeah, um, SUSE Studio basically allows you to create virtual appliances using OpenSUSE or SUSE Linux Enterprise. It is a really, really slick, easy to use web service. It is not fully open source, although many of the components are and run uh, in the OpenSUSE build service. But basically you can create, you can go in there and just create an image. You can even fire it up within the web service to see if it works. And then you can create anything from an ISO image to uh, you know, something to go on a USB key or an AMI to go into Amazon. Uh, it's really impressive stuff. Uh, use ShareSoft creates cloud server temp templates. Uh, I'm not really familiar with that one. David, have you ever used that? I'm sorry? I cannot think I'm saying Okay. We will move on. Any questions on, the, on these tools? All right. Hypervisors. Is anybody, is everybody familiar with hypervisors? Anybody that does not know what a hypervisor is? I, I ask this because uh, you don't know? Okay. It's basically software that will run another operating system on top of the, op, on the top of the operating system. So it's the software that basically runs, that handles the virtualization. So when you want to run multiple operating systems on one machine, you need a hypervisor. Uh, so have you heard of VM, you've heard of VMware like Workstation? Yeah, it's a hypervisor in there. Um, so basically it's handling all of that. Um, for cloud software, um, you're going to usually, especially with open source, you're either going to probably use Zen or KVM. Um, most likely Zen. Uh, KVM is, is becoming more popular as it matures, but it's still, you know, a little bit behind Zen in a number of ways. Um, it, it was in the mainline kernel, but that doesn't necessarily mean it was more suitable for, you know, it just meant that 
Um, it had been, for a number of reasons, it, first of all, it started as a kernel project. It started uh, very small and kind of worked its way up. Uh, whereas Zen, you know, they kind of got the functionality and everything, and then they said, oh, we, we kind of might like to be in the, in the mainline kernel, and they had to negotiate with the different uh, people who handled the different parts of the kernel to make the changes acceptable to everybody involved. So uh, that, took a, that took a little while and some, some finesse. And it, it, you know, it's not uncommon, and you're right. And uh, by the way, what he said was that Zen has, uh, or I'm sorry, KVM seems to have more mind share and buy-in from developers, especially in the Linux uh, kernel team. Yeah, in, yeah, and that is, that is true, although you will find that um, it is not uncommon for a project to have more mind share than is actually merited by its installs in production. Um, so, you know, if you look at, for example, the different cloud technologies, um, some of them are deployed in production pretty widely but don't get as much press, whereas other ones get a lot of press but aren't, aren't yet stable or deployed widely. So... Um, OpenVZ, I don't think um, we have any plans for that, but we have plans to support or do support container for CloudStack. Okay. Okay. Um, and then all the proprietary, you know, VMware, uh, Microsoft Hyper-V, Oracle VM. Any questions on those? I'm sorry? Uh, there, uh, like David said, there's some, uh, sorry, the question is, do we have plans for LXC? Uh, there's apparently discussions about it, but it's not a done deal. So, um, you know, so if you wanted container-based virtualization as opposed to hypervisor, you know, then that might be an option at some point. Um, so compute clouds, let's talk a little bit about the open source projects um, that you have um, as an option. CloudStack, uh, basically, it's been around for several years. It's changed hands a little bit. Uh, started as, what was the, the original name of the company? VMOps. VMOps. And then it became cloud.com, and then it was bought by Citrix, and then Citrix proposed it as a top level, as a Apache project. So it's currently going through incubation there. So eventually, you know, CloudStack will be, we hope, a full-fledged Apache project and part of that foundation. Uh, and so, so kind of in a vendor, vendor neutral environment. Um, Eucalyptus uh, started in 2006. Basically, Eucalyptus aims to be more or less a clone of Amazon EC2 and S3 so that you can, you know, either run your own private clouds or run hybrid clouds using Eucalyptus and Amazon. Um, so if, you're, if your goal is specifically Amazon compatibility, then Eucalyptus looks really good. Um, OpenStack, uh, yes, sorry. I'm sorry? Yeah. Um, so the question I think is, do these solve the problem of lock-in with Amazon? Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, as long as you can either implement your own cloud or do a hybrid cloud or at least have a backup of moving things from Amazon to these, that solves to an extent the lock-in, yeah. Um, as long as Amazon, right, as long as they remain compatible and you're not using services on Amazon. Amazon has a lot of features um, that are not necessarily part of Eucalyptus. You know, they have, for example, their CDN, their, their content delivery network. So if you architect an application to use their CDN, you're still going to have to use that or find an alternative if you move it internally. Uh, if you want to use their monitoring, monitoring solutions, for example, you have to find a replacement internally and that, and that sort of thing. But on the, on the bare layer, yeah, they pretty much solved that. Um, OpenStack uh, started as a NASA project. Um, how many folks have not heard of OpenStack at this point? 
Not a soul. Okay. Um, that's, that's good. Um, so, yeah, start as a NASA project. They are in the midst of forming their own foundation, kind of moving that away from Rackspace a little bit. Um, they just released their Essex release uh, April, I think it was. Um, and it's kind of maturing rapidly. It's probably, um, and I'm, I'm trying to be neutral saying this, I'm not saying this as a CloudStack person, I'm saying this as, you know, just objectively, it's been around less time. Uh, and it's mature, it's a little less mature than Eucalyptus or CloudStack because it hasn't been around as long. Um, and then Open Nebula, I don't actually know a lot about. It's been around for a while. Um, and it is, you know, provides infrastructure as a service. Uh, I'm not actually, I don't know anyone using Open Nebula, so I have not heard much good, bad, or indifferent about it. Um, yeah? Uh, question is, do any of them support Hyper-V? And the answer to that uh, at the moment, I think, is no. Uh, OpenStack did have support for Hyper-V. Uh, the, the support was not actually written by Microsoft. They contracted it out, uh, and then they dropped, basically dropped support for that, so it wasn't maintained, and they yanked it out in the last release because it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't there. So, uh, when they actually yanked it out, as I understand it, that lit a bit of a fire under Microsoft, and I think they are uh, sponsoring work on it again. Uh, and I think I heard something about Microsoft sponsoring Hyper-V support for Open Nebula. Uh, I'm not aware of any Hyper-V activity for CloudStack. Uh, so for the camera, basically, there is some work going on. Uh, it's not a done deal that it will be in anytime soon, but maybe in the next month, there will be support for Hyper-V landing in CloudStack development branch. Would that be correct way to phrase that? Okay. Um, and of course, you know, contributors welcome, patches welcome. Um, any other questions on this? Uh, who asked about Hyper-V? Who was who had that question? Did, do you actually have an interest in running Hyper-V, or were you just kind of? I read about the thing that you were saying earlier, sort of the time of full time that I know, too, like sort of knowing the fact that there's more support. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, Hyper-V, and I mean, you know, if your shop is using, heavily using Hyper-V, maybe open source cloud is not your top priority. Um, you know, I think, and. I, I'm not saying that to knock Hyper-V or Microsoft shops. I'm just saying, you know, if that is your infrastructure, you probably weren't architect or, you know, you weren't planning around open source to start with. So. Yeah, well. Uh, yeah, well, I think VMware probably just has a different user base. Um, so. Uh, and, and I would imagine a lot of people who are considering open source cloud may revisit their, uh, their hypervisors, you know, at some point in the future. By the way, if you are a VMware shop, for example, it's not, I won't, I won't, I'm not one of those people who says, you know, just rip everything out to make everything open source. But I would say as you're planning your, like if you are, if you have a lot of virtualization in place right now, and you're thinking about putting in a cloud infrastructure, I would think, you know, as you phase out servers, you might think about moving to Zen or KVM uh, as that happens, you know. Um, scale up or scale out, basically, um, you know, vertical scaling, scaling up, you want the ability to, you know, uh, make your server a little beefier. So if you have a web server, 
a single web server or a couple web servers and you start seeing a lot more traffic, have the opportunity to add some RAM, uh, add disk space, whatever. Um, in this case though, uh, you don't have to worry about your application logic. Uh, it runs on one single server. Um, you just need to worry about rebooting if you add resources. Um, and you have a single point of failure with a single, you know, when, when you're scaling up. Horizontal scaling basically means you use, uh, you have a distributed application that can run on, you know, two or more servers and you can just throw more servers on as necessary. Things like Hadoop work in that fashion. Any questions there? So the question is, uh, isn't cloud always scalable out? Is that? Um, no, I mean, so like for example, um, if you're using, I always go back to Amazon because that's the most, you know, widely recognized, but even with uh, OpenStack or CloudStack or whatever. So you start a EC2 server or something like that. If you're talking about infrastructure as a service, you're basically running virtual machines, okay? Um, and so you are approaching that just as if you were running on bare metal or just individual virtual machines. There's no guarantee that that's going to be scalable out because your application is still, you know, as if it was going to run on that number of machines. Um, but you have the advantage of like you can basically say, well, um, this instance is being heavily taxed, so I can start up a higher, you know, a more um, powerful instance to handle that load. Whereas you need to, you know, cloud gives you the ability to scale out, but you need to plan for it. So it is not automatically scale outable. Right. Oh yeah. I mean that 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 is, you know, a heck of a, a feature is basically the ability to just say, well, this, you know, this is dogging, and so I'm just going to say. You know, even when you're, like I used to work for a hosting company and, um, you know, you would have customers who outgrow, you know, a certain resource or whatever on a physical server and you'd have to transfer that workload to a, a beefier server. And that was, you know, some percentage of downtime, no matter how you did it. Whereas if you're running, you know, if you're doing cloud stuff, it's just, okay, I'm going to be down for like the two minutes it takes me to reboot, but when I come back up, I've got all the hardware resources. So... Uh, cloud comp computing storage, this is kind of important. This is where you're going to have all your data living. Uh, you have a couple of options. Uh, GlusterFS, uh, which is now Red Hat, I believe. Um, scale out uh, network attached storage. Um, and it runs over Ethernet or InfiniBand. Uh, you have Ceph, which is kind of a newer project. Uh, they just got a company supporting them called Ink Tank. Um, Distributed file system developed by DreamHost. Uh, what's really interesting about Ceph is it supports a number of different types of storage. It'll actually like emulate Amazon S3, for example. So, you know, if you wanted to set up your own cloud storage, it supports that. OpenStack Swift, uh, object storage for clouds. Um, Sheepdog, I have, I do not know anything about really. Uh, anybody using Sheepdog or have heard of it? Okay, other than, other than, you're the ringer. You're like, you're, you're yeah, he's, he's destroying the curve here. Um, sorry? Have not used it. Okay. All right, well, you still get credit for hearing of it. Um, NFS, basically, is anyone unfamiliar with NFS? Uh, kind of old, reliable, but not necessarily all that performant uh, or scalable. Um, then there are, projects that help abstract APIs. So basically, if you're writing applications um, and you don't know what your customers or your um, users are going to have as a cloud backend, you can use one of these to try to translate APIs. So basically, they may be using CloudStack or they may use Amazon or they may use something else. These things try to help bridge so you don't have to write uh, for each API individually. Um, anybody developing for clouds in here? Probably doesn't apply a lot to you if you're not a developer. 
platform as a service. I, th I find these very interesting, uh, and I'm very glad that there are some open source efforts going on. How many folks are familiar with like Engine Yard and, and uh, Heroku? Okay. Um, so these, these platforms are basically, you have a PHP or a Ruby application, Ruby on Rails, you can drop it into their service and they make it scalable uh, and much easier to manage. Um, but the problem with Heroku and Engine Yard is that they are proprietary. Um, so there are a couple of platform as a service open source projects to be aware of. Cloud Foundry, sponsored by VMware. Um, and you can see over here all the different languages that they support, Java, Ruby on Rails, uh, Node.js, Grails, Scala, uh, Python, PHP. Um, so you have a, a wide variety of languages. Um, OpenShift from Red Hat, they uh, had to edit this slide because I guess when, when uh, Mark had done it, OpenShift still had not released code, but they released code a couple months ago. So now you can start up your own platform as a service or you can have Red Hat run it or you can do kind of a hybrid. Um, and they support Java, Ruby, PHP, Perl, and Python. PHP Fog, uh, as the name implies, handles PHP, um, basically Ruby, Python, .NET, MySQL, and Postgres. Uh, it is, I guess, not fully open source, but they're built based on Cloud Foundry and they do some contri contributions back upstream. Staccato from Active State, um, again, not fully open source. Um, they support Java, Python, PHP, Ruby, Perl, Node.js, and others. Uh, and WSO2 Stratus, which I'm not, again, not very familiar with, uh, but it's uh, JBoss and Java. So if you need those, yeah, Bruce. So, and this is probably something like that. I understand how both work with Uh, so the question is, um, basically, why would you want to run a private pass? Right. Okay. Um, well, there are a couple of reasons. So, you know, say, say you're a government agency and you do want to be able to run, you know, you want to basically, you just want your developers to worry about the application. You don't want them to worry about the infrastructure. So you have a pass set up based on OpenShift or Cloud Foundry, and all they worry about is the, the code. Um, and it handles some of the abstractions, not only of running the code, but also managing its life cycle, getting it in there, um, interfacing with Git, stuff like that. So it makes it much easier for the developers. Um, right. Well, they're not only just running it on your own machine, but also, yeah, I mean, having full control and, and um, the other thing is, you know, there are a lot of hosting providers in the world that may want to offer a platform as a service because they can offer, you know, the, the uh, Rackspace likes to call it, what is it, fanatical support, you know, and you can offer that to customers uh, who may not be comfortable working with Amazon, but they feel comfortable working with a company like Contigix that's just down the street. Um, so, you know, that's another good reason for this. Um, and I think the other, the other argument I think is really nice about these is just that they exist, you know? Maybe you feel comfortable right now with uh, Red Hat. So you say, okay, we're just gonna go ahead and go whole hog into OpenShift. We're gonna just pay uh, Red Hat to host it and everything, but we have the code out there and we know it's out there so that if someday somebody acquires Red Hat that we don't like, we have an escape hatch. Um, I think just the existence of these projects in a lot of ways is, is a strong argument for them. Yeah.
Yeah. So the question is, are these built on, th on top, are the platforms as a service built on top of things like infrastructure as a service like CloudStack? Uh, yes, uh, for example, I believe OpenShift, uh, the test uh, system or the documents that they gave for Red Hat or for, for running OpenShift on Fedora uh, were around OpenShift, or I'm sorry, OpenStack, for example. So yeah, they can be written around that. And I believe Cloud Foundry, uh, the, the thing there is it's written around VMware's stuff. So you have the opportunity to run an open source platform as a service on top of a proprietary um, cloud, so. Okay, so if you release right now, uh, I don't know that that's true. Um, I think they may, either they may support or have the option of supporting those. So, um, so I'm not, I'm not trying to say VMware is saying you can only do that. I'm just saying, you know, they're, obviously they've kind of got an interest in making it the, the best thing to run on top of their stuff. So, and again, you know, there are probably a lot of government agencies or companies that are running a lot of VMware, and it makes sense to them to say, we want a platform as a service, and we want to run it internally. So it makes sense for them, and, and you know, maybe they hope for a lot more contributions from, from other companies, too. So uh, I forget, Cloud Foundry was actually another company that was acquired by VMware, if I'm not mistaken, but I forget who they were. Um, David, do you remember? Okay. All right. Okay. So the next thing is managing clouds with open source tools. Uh, it doesn't help much to have a uh, cloud if you can't manage it. Um, and you kind of want, you know, as much automation as humanly possible. Um, so there are so several types of management tools that you want to look at. Uh, provisioning, uh, basically installing operating systems and other software. So basically getting things ready to run sort of RPM on a meta scale. Uh, configuration management, you know, handling changes across all of your servers. Um, orchestration automation, uh, you know, handling tasks between different systems. Uh, and monitoring is always a good idea uh, so that you can tell when a machine dies and, and your orchestration software needs to start something again or start a new server. Um, or take over for a physical server that's died and start up another one. Um, any questions on that? All right. Uh, tool chains, everybody is familiar with the concept of a tool chain. Basically, you know, uh, started with Unix where you basically have, you know, one utility that produces text output, goes to another utility that can do something to it, that can send it to another, pipe it to another utility, and eventually you have something useful. Uh, that's kind of moved up. Um, you know, where now you have tool chains of different uh, orchestration tools and different monitoring tools that work that send output to one another um, to do things. So let's talk about some of the open source provisioning tools. You have Kickstart. Anybody familiar with this? So, yeah, doesn't need a lot of uh, a lot of explanation. It's been around for a good long time. Um, yeah, I love how we have a question mark. Nobody knows when it started. Um, Cobbler um, plus Cone for Pixie Boot. Um, started in 2007, works with Red Hat, OpenSUSE, Fedora, Debian, and Ubuntu. Uh, Spacewalk came out in 2008 and works mostly with Fedora and CentOS. Uh, and Crowbar is uh, for bare metal provisioning. I think it's also used widely with uh, CloudStack, or I'm sorry, OpenStack. Um, any questions on that? Uh, basically, yeah, getting a server to handle. Sorry, oh, sorry, I'm getting I'm getting the flag. Um, so the question was again. I'm sorry, say again. Okay. And the question is, how is bare metal provisioning distinct from what the others do? Um, basically, bare metal provisioning is actually getting a server. You know, you've got a server in a rack, and it can actually provision it with an operating system and get it started, as opposed to doing another kind of provisioning, like just putting software onto something. So, and can handle other, I think it can handle other, um, you know, networking provisioning and things like that. Like, um, I would guess there's some provisioning of network, you know, possibly works with switches and things like that as well. Um, don't quote me on that. Um, 
configuration management tools, uh, the, the old uh, venerable CF engine, which started in 1993 and kind of has gotten a bit of a resurgence lately as they've noticed there's a big market for these things now. Um, there is Chef, uh, started in 2009 based on Ruby. Um, and uh, it's basically um, kind of becoming very popular. Um, there's Puppet, uh, friend of mine who, who uh, started that way back in 2004, Luke Caney's. Does anybody know Luke? Bruce, you got it. You don't know? No. Um, anyway, uh, it's a really interesting project um, written in Ruby. Um, and it is very popular and works really well with the Unix type systems. They're adding a lot more features for Windows management as well. Um, Salt started last year. I'm not very familiar with this one, uh, but I think they had some pre presentations here itself. Anybody see that? Sorry? Right, okay, yeah. I mean, the, the idea with these basically is so you have, um, let's say you have 100 systems and you need to install a package on all of them. You know, you can do that very easily with a couple lines of code and, you know, Puppet or Chef. Um, you know, if you need to do um, some sort of user management or, you know, delete a file or whatever. You can do all these different things with these, with these tools, um, which is much, much faster and better than, you know, logging into each server individually and doing them. Um, sure, yeah, they work, they work very well, yeah. They work, you know, they, these, uh, especially like Puppet and CF Engine, were popular well before cloud software actually took off. But now with cloud, they're becoming very popular as a way to, to manage, to leverage that. So, monitoring tools, there's a Cacti uh, RRD tool. Uh, there's Graphite, uh, Nodgeos. Uh, I remember Nodgeos very well from my hosting days. <laughs> Not fondly, I might add. Uh, Zabbix um, and Zenos. So there are a bunch of different options. Some are just performance monitoring. So basically they just, you know, they look and say, uh, you know, look and see how the performance of machines are. Nagios basically is looking to see, is this, is this service still up? Does it, is it still working? Um, there's, a, you know, Zabbix handles performance and availability. Um, and Zenos actually looks at performance availability and event management. So, you know, you have the ability to say, did this thing happen? Um, not just, you know, is the service up? Any questions on those? Okay. Anybody unsold on the idea of monitoring? Okay, good. Um, automated, automation and orchestration tools. You've got uh, Capistrano, Rundeck, Funk, M Collective and uh, salt, um, and I don't have a lot of experience with any of these personally. Ask me in a month, and I might have a strong opinion. From like Puppet? Um, David, you want to field that? I think you might. So uh, an orchestration tool would say something like, I want to start processing a batch of this work and I want to process it on these machines right now. Or mm -hmm. perhaps you integrate it with something like Jenkins and you say, all right, now my 50 web servers need to have my newly updated uh, web application. And so this is more um, uh, configuration management tools describe a given state this is um, this is more around either scheduling or uh, automating discrete jobs. So these are the things that this does are not idempotent, 
right? And so config management typically wants item potent items. To, well, you know, you, you certainly want config management. You may have an environment that demands uh, orchestration tools as well, but not necessarily. Okay. Moving on. So here's like a, you know, an idea of a tool chain that you might use. So you would basically, you know, start by generating your images uh, and then moving them over into CloudStack or OpenStack uh, and then handling provisioning um, and then using, you know, services he was just talking about for, you know, starting and stopping services. Um, and then, you know, at all times you're going to be using monitoring tools to uh, keep an eye on all of this. Probably less so for the generating images, but the rest of it. Um, any questions on that? All right. Any other questions? General questions? Yes. Sorry? Yeah, so the question is, does salt include both? And is, yeah. Well, it came, it came later. Um, and it was, you know, salt was um, basically written around the time, you know, the cloud started to become very important. So I think they probably took a different scope when they decided to start the project. Yeah, it, um, if you look at these tools in general, though, you'll see that CF Engine came first. Um, Luke was a CF Engine guy and actually sold services around CF Engine and got really upset at things that he didn't like about CF Engine, so he wrote Puppet. So then Adam Jacobs was a Puppet guy, and he found lots of things that he didn't like about Puppet, and he wrote Chef. And I think if you talk to the Salt guys, they they weren't in isolation. Th these are each iterations of things. Uh, now you have the guys who've written things like uh, Chef and, and Puppet who've gone back and written tools to start filling those needs. So in Collective is Puppet Lab's orchestration tool. And it works really well with, uh, with that. Uh, Knife does some of the things that, that you would expect out of an orchestration tool, although not completely. And so it really is a, a timeline issue um, because the guys at Salt were a, Salt Stack were able to stand on the shoulders of giants. They produced something that's a little more complete than the guys who started it back in the 90s. Basically, with most open source projects, probably one of the one of the questions you can ask yourself or ask the founders if you get a chance to talk to them is like, you know. So what project were you using before you got annoyed enough to write your own, you know? Um, and that's usually how many of these projects get started. You just look at, you know, whatever the project is and say, what were you using before? Oh, this is why you've done things this way. Um, so these, this is my contact information if you uh, need to get in touch with me. Um, don't quite formally have my Citrix email address yet, so... Uh, uh, but I think it's just uh, joe.brockmeyer at citrix.com. And um, you can always find me on Twitter. And there are, oh, is anybody still copying that over? I can go back. Any other questions while we're... It's been a long day. Everybody kind of has that thousand-yard stare at this point. It's like, ugh. How many folks are going to the keynote? Okay. Be nice to Steven. He's a good guy. Heckle, but gently, you know. Um, all right. So some other resources um, if you want to take a look. And these are up on SlideShare. So if you want to copy these slides, these are lightly modified from Mark's original. Um, so just search for, uh, for this presentation on SlideShare, or send me an email and I'll send it to you. Okay, thank you very much, and hope you have a good rest of the conference. Cloud stacks are everywhere. 
this is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Well, stack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack, as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. 
Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk-based systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox-based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.